So it should, should go now. Yep, I see the desktop. Maybe just try refreshing. Oh, yep, there we are. Okay, so let's see if you talk. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Talking about lithography. No, I hear somebody else. It's probably a delay. Give it a second and see if you can hear. Oh, I see the. Okay, there we go. Okay. That's good, right? Yep. Awesome. Are you going to go present first or should I? Whatever, whatever works. Paper, rock, scissors? I'll go if you don't mind. Go for it. We're going to do the seminar in 10 minutes or so, I guess. Okay. Yep. Yep. Come on, grab a seat. Grab a coffee or tea or a cookie, maybe. <laughs> Poke their head in and then run away. <laughs> yeah, it does. To get the aircraft things. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny because I saw there's an arrow in the lobby there mm -hmm. when I was sitting there waiting for you. I'm like, oh, I guess we could actually put on like our little flag and let the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this way. Well, I'm pretty sure people at the university can probably find a room number. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm I would think so. <laughs> One would have to hold if we and had to most of them should be familiar with the building and stuff, <laughs> so it should be. Unless we had to change rooms, then it might have been a... <laughs> then I would have suggested an arrow or something like that. I would have like put that. them yeah. down like breadcrumbs on the... <laughs> Hello.
This is smart.
been some of the tools that are available. Some people prefer different schedules. Um, I was playing. I guess you don't. I wouldn't want that. The confidential information goes. You have your information between the daytime and nighttime. So you always put that on the screen. I know. Pretty well isolated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know down at U of T, there's like some of the stuff that you wear down at the bottom. Yeah, probably too wide. The one I visited in May last year was in Twente, and they had something was very too shaky. So they built the structure and had everything hanging from the ceiling. And being set insulated for everything, they also then have a right that you come in, and the right hand side is kind of a seismographic machine. So here we see every earthquake twice, like going through the planet and coming and traveling across the surface. <laughs> but yeah, we are insulated, so it's all hanging from this. That's quite a, yeah. I mean, this this the cleaner is on a separate foundation. Yeah. The yeah. Buildings, but yeah. Not, just like giant springs, but yeah. hanging is a whole But yeah, I mean, they have them like connect. There's no bad You can fill out your job application. <laughs> Don't worry, I can do Tarzan. I can swing in. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm my Vito. Yes, good. Lisa McDonald. Lisa, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, I, I think I know you. <laughs> I'm, I'm the director of the uh, Nano Lab. Well, thank okay. you very well, thank yeah. You. Yeah, thank yeah, thank you very much oh, for helping host it. Sounds like an exciting new capability. So. All right. We're going to have him find some money. Once more. Yeah. We'll put them in charge. No, they just have <laughs> anything else. No pressure, Pat. No pressure. We'll grab a coffee, maybe. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is way down the evolution line, so it survived the meteor crash. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sure. I remember I got to build my YouTube uh, creds with my kids. get started is close to one o'clock so you guys can uh, continue on with your day but uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming my name is Lisa McDonald I work for Spectra Research Corporation we're the Canadian representatives for Heidelberg Instruments and um, we have uh, Niels Gordecker here um, who will be giving a presentation with regards to uh, the Nan uh, Heidelberg Nano Division and I'll introduce uh, Niels in a second and I also would, would like to thank Greg Holloway um, he has helped coordinate this um, he works with the MLA 150 that we have downstairs, which is the Heidelberg uh, larger instrument. And he's going to be giving his presentation on the massless grayscale photolithography. If at any point in time you have questions, obviously feel free to interrupt. We'll have some question sessions at the end. Um, if you have any questions about any of the other technologies that SRC offers, you know, feel free to come see me afterwards or any of these ones. And I'll be happy to help you out with any questions you might have. I'll let Greg take it away. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm Greg Holloway. I know most of you here from working in the fab. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about fast, fast maskless grayscale photolithography. Uh, the reason I put fast in quotes is because fast means different things to different people. Uh, to me, this is, is quite fast and I'm going to go through what I, exactly I mean by that. But this is probably not a mass production tool. This is more of the R&D development type tools that we have in the fab. But 
it is a very fast way to implement this maskless grayscale photolithography. So let's break down each of those terms just so we're all on the same page. When I'm talking about photolithography, uh, I'm talking about exposing photosensitive polymers resist to light uh, to create patterns that we're going to use in our fabrication process. Uh, with photolithography, we're talking about things on the micron scale and bigger. Maskless is what I'm referring to as a process that is not fixed in time. We can our patterns are computer generated. The tool interacts with the com with a computer to change the pattern on the fly. If I make a pattern, I do my experiment, and I see that I need to change dimension, I just go change my design, and I can immediately expose my new pattern. And finally, grayscale, which is the most interesting new part of this talk, uh, it talks about making these two two and a half D structures. So you can see on this image on the right that I have, it's this pattern that I've exposed has some topography. It's not just a straight whether something is exposed or not exposed, but I've made these kind of hills and valley features uh, in the resist. So the whole point is how can we implement all three of these things on the tools in the fab and specifically on the MLA 150. So what are some applications of this? Well, pretty much whatever you can think to expose that's 2.5D, you can expose on the tool. That's what we want to try and enable here is whatever you want to expose uh, you can do, but here are some examples that I thought of that are relevant. Uh, a lot of optical things like diffractive optic elements. So on the right, we've got blazed gratings, uh, diffraction gratings, but instead of them just being straight gratings, they've got an angle to them. This improves the efficiency of the grating, giving you, uh, really allowing you to channel the diffracted light into a particular order. Um, we've got optical interference patterns. So on the bottom, I'm showing kind of a computer generated hologram interference pattern. I'll talk more about that one a little later on. And then some microfluidic type devices. So for micro, microfluidic devices, you're making kind of channels in your resist to move around fluids on the chip. If you do a normal exposure, you'll kind of have this binary exposure where you might have a square channel. But with grayscale lithography, we can shape the resist. We can start to make more like tubes in the resist, and this can improve uh, motion of the fluids, gets rid of turbulence, things like that. It allows you to have a lot more control in what you're doing with your device. So as I said, these are some examples, but whatever you can think of, you can potentially do uh, with this technique. And so going back to basics, I just want to talk very quickly about the how uh, photolithography works, because when we build up this grayscale technique, I want to make sure you guys have an understanding of what's going on. So when we talk about photolithography, we have a substrate coated with photoresist. That photoresist is a mix of like a Novolac resin and DNQ. This is one particular implementation of uh, positive tone resist. There's kind of lots of variants of this, but many work on the same kind of principle. We have this mix of uh, these two chemicals. The DNQ prevents the resin from being dissolved in the developer. So if we take this unexposed resist, we put it in our developing solution, it's going to dissolve in that developing solution very slowly. We say the development rate is very slow. So in this case, I say it's less than a nanometer per second. It's not going to change very much. However, if we expose that resist to light, I've got some light coming down here. It's going to change the resist in that area, specifically interacts with the DNQ. It changes, that's a photosensitive material. It changes that material. I've changed it, made it to a different color here. And when that happens, it increases the development rate, the, the, the rate that this, this um, resist dissolves in the developer dramatically. So now if we take this chip that's been exposed and put it in developer, the part that's exposed will get removed. So we've made a nice channel in our resist. How are we going to actually shape the light to do this? Well, the classical way to do it is with a mask. So we take a piece of glass, we put some chrome on one side of the mask in the particular shape of the pattern that we want, and then we illuminate the entire thing with light. And wherever there's not chrome on the mask, the light can get through and expose the sample in the shape of the mask, achieving this result. So what does that actually look like? Here are some pictures that I took of a photo mask on the left. Uh, everything that's white is the chrome material and everything that's dark is the glass. So everywhere that it's dark, light is going to get through and hit our sample and expose that resist. And on the right, I showed you a pattern that I exposed and you can see they match pretty much, uh, they're pretty identical. In that case, the blue is the substrate underneath, so you're seeing the silicon there and everything that's kind of that purpley red is the resist. So the chrome blocked their light from hitting the resist. So when we develop, that part stays on the sample. So that's how we can use a mask to implement photolithography. The problem is, uh, what if I make this device and I realize, oh, this is too big. I want this to be half the size. Uh, I, since I've made this mask, this piece of glass with chrome on it, 
if I want to make that change, I got to go get a new mask. I send it to a company, they make the new design that I want, and then I can do the exposure again. Uh, but that can be time consuming. It's hard to kind of iterate and develop your process in that way. And so that's why we uh, use maskless photolithography. This is what I was talking about with having the ability to have a computer connected to your exposure tool and able to shape the beam into whatever pattern that you want. And so I'm kind of talking about one implementation of that would be like a laser spot tool. So we have a laser which shines, say, blue light. We've kind of reflected off a mirror. Obviously, the optics would be much more complicated than this, but kind of a basic idea was you're focusing uh, the light down to a very small point. That's kind of the resolution of your system, say. Then you can take that, and by adjusting the optics, you can scan that dot across your sample, and you expose your resist in whatever shape you move the dot. I've drawn it here as a very analog thing of it just sweeping back and forth, but in reality, the beam moves digitally. You can think of that square there as being composed of a whole bunch of pixels. What actually happens is the beam goes to the first pixel, turns on for the required amount of time to expose that pixel, and then moves on through all the rest of the pixels in the shape. This digital exposure lets us encode whatever kind of shape we want. I've shown rectangles here. You can do circles, squares, whatever you want, as long as you can express it digitally. So then the question is, OK, we want to make one of these tools. How fast can we actually uh, do an exposure? We've got a, uh, we were going to take a blue laser. These blue lasers are very readily available these days. If we go on Amazon, we can buy a 5.5 watt blue laser for $220. It's a steal of a deal. <laughs> exactly. But you can get a cheap, a, a cheap blue laser. These are for like engraving and cutting things with this. I think you can cut through like two or three millimeters of wood, no problem. So it's definitely more than enough power for exposing our, our resist. Um, yep. Yeah, so so that's that's the easy part, I should say. You think the laser might be the hard part, but that's the easy part. The problem, and so then if we think about it, if we've got, let's say, one watt to make the math simple, our resists uh, usually require a dose, an amount of energy for them to be exposed so that we get that chemical reaction to take place. And we express that in the units of millijoules per centimeter square. Millijoules, as we know, is just milliwatts per second. So how many watts we're applying per second over an area gives us the dose. With that knowledge, we can do a quick calculation and see that a four inch wafer uh, the standard dose for these resists, we could expose the one watt laser in 10 seconds, which would be great. We could pat, pop out wafers very, very fast um, if all we have to do is worry about the, the power of the laser. Unfortunately, there's a few other things that are, um, are also determining our exposure time. So the problem is how fast can we move the beam across all of these pixels? So if we, have to, if we say our pixels are one by one micron in size, which is fairly generous size, then one pixel at the same dose and laser power is going to require one nanosecond exposure, which is quite fast. Have, being able to turn that laser on for that precise amount of time in that pixel uh, it, with one nanosecond speed is pretty hard to do. Uh, additionally, if we want to expose a four inch wafer, if they're one by one micron in size, there's going to be about eight billion pixels on the wafer. So that means we have to move the laser, aim it from one one micron square to the next one, let it stabilize all that. Um, and if we want to do it in 10 seconds, then that means we have to do it in less than a nanosecond. Uh, so that's what's really going to limit the speed of our exposures, all of this beam moving and things like that. And in reality, with these kind of tools, it takes over an hour to expose a 4-inch wafer with kind of one micron resolution. So as I said, the problem isn't the laser power. It's being able to move the beam where we want it to be and address uh, the pixels in our pattern. And so the solution to this, to make it go a lot faster, which is what the MLA-150 employs, a uh, very, very smart way to do this, is with a digital micromirror device. And so I'm, what this is is a whole bunch of mirrors. And so I'm going to take my mirror in the, my little cartoon on the right there and replace it with a bunch of mirrors. So I've shown four mirrors here. And with this, uh, in this mode, each of the mirrors can expose one pixel of my pattern at a time. So I'm not exposing one pixel after another in series. I'm exp exposing a whole chunk of them all at, a all at the same time. So I'm exposing an area at a time. Um, and what a DMD actually looks like is here. This is a Texas, Texas Instruments DMD. And you can see each of these little diamonds here is a mirror. And you can see at the bottom they've tilted a few of them. They can all be addressed individually. They can turn on and off by tilting in one direction or another. So this allows us to expose a whole bunch of pixels all at once, not just one pixel with the laser spot. 
So how are we going to make this work? So let's give you a little um, demonstration of what's actually do what the tool is actually doing to expose these areas and kind of connect them all together. So I'm going to take my laser hitting the mirror from before. I'm going to put another lens in there because I want my laser light to cover my whole DMD, not just one spot of it, but the whole DMD. At this point, we've got multiple beams coming down from each mirror hitting our sample. And so in this case, all of these pixels would be on in our exposure. If we can turn those mirrors independently, if I can turn them all off and then just kind of shine them on some other thing so they're not hitting my sample, I've turned them all off in this case. So being able to switch them on and off independently allows me to encode a pattern. So let's say I want to make this pattern at the bottom here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on a few of my mirrors, shine a few laser spots of the sample, and expose those pixels. Then I move my sample so that uh, a different part is under the DMD exposure area. I adjust my mirrors, I expose again, and I just step and repeat this process over my entire wafer. Moving the sample, encoding the pattern in the mirrors, and then exposing. And that way I can reproduce my target pattern. And I'm not just exposing one pixel at a time, but in this case four, and that makes things go a lot faster. In the MLA-150, the DMD size is 1,000 by 768 pixels. So we're exposing about 800,000 pixels at one time. So that makes things uh, go a lot faster in that regard. Um, the actual addressable size of each pixel on the sample is 100 by 100 nanometers. So it's even better kind of stepping resolution than my example before of one micron. And in this case, the time to expose one DMD area, so that full 800,000 pixels, is about eight microseconds. <clears throat> In this case, we actually kind of want it to be slower, right? Because in the past, when we were looking at that single spot exposure, we couldn't keep up with that one nanosecond requirement. That's too fast to kind of control uh, the laser. But in this case, if we have eight microseconds to expose on the sample, it's a lot easier to control the system. And it's a lot, it, the electronics are a lot more easily uh, reachable in that kind of time frame. Similarly, over a four inch wafer, we don't need eight billion individual pixels. We only need 100 million of these uh, individual uh, DMD exposure, so this makes things go a lot faster. Where there's not such the we or the electronics can actually keep up with the requirements that we're trying to reach here, and with that we can expose these wafers much faster. Not 10 seconds fast, but in 10 minutes, which is kind of an order of magnitude improvement over the laser spot tools. So this is what helps the MLA be such a fast tool, and that's why everybody likes it because it makes the exposures run so quickly. So the next step is now that we understand how the MLA is working, how can we implement this grayscale lithography there? How can we control the exposure uh, to get these kind of hills and valleys and stuff like that? So a reminder, with our normal exposure process, we expose the resist. It changes this D and Q. And then when we develop, we can develop this binary exposure. Let's say instead of doing that exposure that we re drastically reduce the, la the laser power. And it's so, I've made the rectangle so light here that you can't even see it, I don't think, on the projector. But imagine I've lowered the laser power uh, and I'm getting much less exposure here. In that case, maybe f less of my D and Q fully converts. Maybe I'm only getting half of the chemical reactions to take place. And so the resist is partially exposed. In this case, our development rate is going to be less. It's not going to be incredibly fast. It's just going to be kind of in between the fully exposed and partially exposed regime. And in this case, if I put it in the developer, you can see I made the, the resist develop much slower here. Uh, so this gives us kind of a control over our resist. By changing how much we expose it, we can change how fast it develops. And if we don't develop for as long, we could leave some resist there. So this allows us to change the height. Instead of having fully, ex fully exposed or not exposed at all, we can have an intermediate, uh, partially exposed region. So I said earlier, or the previous slide, that we would do that by lowering the laser power. Well, that's not very feasible. We don't want to go mucking around with the laser and these very fast time scales that will never kind of change fast enough. A better approach is to change the exposure time. So here, I'm kind of showing the laser exposing the resist for a fixed amount of time. And now again, I'm going to expose only the left area for a longer, or a second time. So now this area is more exposed than the right-hand area. That means they're going to have different development rates. So again, I put them in the developer. They develop at different rates. So I might get one that's fully developed, one that's partially developed, and areas that are not at all developed. So I'm building up this kind of step-like structure here. And of course, here I only picked two uh, different doses, fully and partially exposed. But I can kind of make however many steps in between that I want to make a fully smooth transition from fully to partial to, to not exposed at all. 
So varying the development rate, or sorry, the exposure time allows us to change the dose, which then changes the development rate, giving us this structure. So what we want to do next in order to actually do this uh, grayscale development is to measure a contrast curve. So this is where we take the resist, we expose large areas with varying dose, and then I, in this case, I took them and put them through the profilometer and measures the height of the resist that was remaining as a function of the dose. So it's zero dose, I don't expose the sample at all, I've got the full resist thickness, and then you can see when I get out to about 10 uh, millijoules per centimeter square of dose, the resist starts to actually get removed, and then we have a roughly linear decrease to say about 50 uh, millijoules. So this is what lets us like kind of pick what resist thickness we want. If I want half the resist remaining, I pick it around 30 or 25 and end up with half the resist remaining. So this is my, my guide to tuning whatever kind of resist uh, structure I want. So now that we have the how we're going to actually, uh, well, now we want to look at how we can implement this on the actual tools. How am I going to vary the time for each of these pixels? So going back to the spot-based tool, this is very easy. All we have to do is when we're exposing these different squares, we just turn on, we change how long the beam shines on each spot. So here I've made the squares fill at different rates to show that I'm exposing the edges for longer than the middle. And as a result, the dose varies in the same way based on the exposure time. When it's exposed more at the edges and less in the middle, I get this kind of, I would get this kind of peaked shape if I were to develop this. It's very easy to do this. We just say, when you get to each pixel, here's the time that you should expose it for. There's not really any overhead to this. You could just implement this right away. And this is indeed what the tool manufacturers of this type of tool do. They just change the time of each exposure. However, if we go back to our DMD, this isn't so easy. When I've got all of these mirrors shining the light down at the same time, how do I tell this pixel to get a different amount of time than this pixel? I can't. They're kind of both stuck on for the same amount of time. So one way to get around this would be to do multiple exposures, multiple passes. So I didn't bother animating the mirrors in this case. It's too much work. But uh, <laughs> imagine that I've exposed all of them on this first pass, and then I'm not exposing the middle one on the second pass, and then I'm not exposing the middle three on the next pass, and so on and so forth. I can kind of slowly build up that same sloped exposure pattern. The only problem here is that I've required multiple passes, multiple exposures to build up these layers. And that's going to take time. Each time is another essentially full exposure. So if to do six layers like we did in this case, you could potentially require six times more exposure. And then we're not really gaining anything by using this particular implementation. Maybe there's smarter ways you can encode the layer so it wouldn't take six times for six layers, but still, it's kind of too much overhead. So what's the alternative? How, how else could we do this more efficiently? And so the idea for this is kind of the whole point of this talk. And first, I want to go back and talk about how, you could, how people have done this in the past with photo masks. And they've done what's called pulse width or pulse density modulation. And this is where they take their pattern and they make sub-resolution features where they vary either the density of these features or the width of them. So this, or sorry, the other way around, density, yeah, density and width. So, um, and you can see because of the size of these squares is changing, we've effectively got higher dose in the middle and less dose on the edges. If these features are smaller than the resolution of the tool, we won't see each individual square, but we'll see just the overall lower amount of light or higher amount of light getting to each place because of the change in size. Um, you're probably, even if you've never seen this with regard to photo mass, you've probably seen this technique before because it's been around for over 150 years and it's used in half-tone printing. Normal printing, they change the size of the circles. Um, so here's a picture of my cat that I did in half-tone printing style. And you can see uh, when I zoom in on his ear, the dark parts that just made the circles they're printing larger and the outside they made the circle smaller. And when we look at it sub-resolution, as in I mean, like not looking at each individual dot, when we look at it far away, we just see the picture of the cat. We don't see the individual dots. That's kind of the same idea here. The tool is going to address each individual circle, but when we look at it from far away, at the kind of resolution of the features, you're not going to end up seeing these small changes. You're just going to see the overall dose variation. So the, with that in mind, remember that with the MLA, our actual addressable pixel size is 100 by 100 nanometers. But the kind of minimum achievable resolution is one micron. So our sub-resolution features are on the order of 100 nanometers, with our actual resolution being one micron. So if we take the same pattern that we looked at earlier, if these kind of squares here are one micron, if we zoom in on them, 
each of these squares is actually composed of 10 by 10 of these 100 by 100 nanometer actual pixels. So when I'm exposing this square, I turn all of these mirrors on and I expose that square. But what if I instead only turn on half the mirrors? What if every other mirror gets turned on? Now I've essentially got half the light going to this one by one micron pixel. So this allows me to, to change it uh, with, for, so I can have this one at half the dose and this one at the full dose. So when they're getting exposed at the same time, um, they're getting different doses, but not requiring multiple passes through the machine. Yes. So what might that look like? So fit, like half exposed makes sense. You turn everyone on and off. But here's some other examples of what kind of 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 90% filling might look like. And in this case, the dashed lines would be your one by one micron pixels. And the small red squares, reddish pinkish squares, are the 100 by 100 nanometer addressable pixel sizes. So that's what it looks like. So then uh, just for demonstration, if we go to K layout, everybody's favorite um, GDS file prep software. Uh, I've made this simple pattern where we've got these, uh, I've used the colors to indicate the relative dose that I want. So uh, dark red is 100, so that's fully exposed. And the dark blue is only 10% exposed. So I'm going to make, again, these kind of peaked structures. And we can write a nice simple macro in K layout. And all we do is run this grayscale macro and turn on this. And it's converted all of those dose variations into these individual pixels. So it's very easy to convert your pattern into this kind of structure if you set up the layers appropriately. And here I only did uh, kind of 10%, 20%. You can go all the way down to 1% dose variations if you really want to get that fiddly with it. It's just changing the number of pixels there. All right, where was I? So yes, that part is very easy to do. And the results, that pattern that I just showed you, I expose it on the MLA. And look, it comes out very nice. So we've got these peaks uh, on the top here, kind of increasing and decreasing. There is that isolated one in the box. If I zoom in, this is what they look like. We're getting these nice peak structures just like we'd hope. It's great. The only problem. Uh, we try to do a large pattern, and the software complains. So uh, I made a pattern that was 9 by 9 millimeters, a 1 centimeter square pattern. And I tried to run it through the MLA software. And 43 minutes later, it hadn't started exposing yet. And when I go and look at the files, it hasn't it converted any of the files yet. It's just too complicated. All those pixels that it's having to, turn, that it's having to encode into the actual exposure, it just can't handle it all. So what can we do? Uh, we make our own script to convert it. So I've written a script in Python uh, to convert these patterns. And with this, with this, we can convert a one centimeter by one centimeter pattern in a couple of minutes. So rather than 40 minutes to not get a one centimeter by one centimeter pattern, we can do it in a couple of minutes. So that's an improvement. And um, the converted files are then ready to expose in the normal MLA software. So it's not requiring any changes to the software. We run the conversion, and then we can just load it normally and expose. Um, as you normally would. OK, so what do the results of this look like? So uh, in the first slide, I showed you this top right image, which is kind of an example of this uh, computer-generated hologram. And so this is an optical interference pattern. I'll describe that in a moment. But essentially, it requires that, that we have resist uh, squares of different height, and the light's going to interact with those different squares to make an image. And on the bottom here, you can see how I've really zoomed in on a few of these squares, and you can see they're as a number of different heights there. There's 10 different dose values here, or 10 different height values that are given this pattern. So how does this work? Well, I pattern this on glass because it's an optical effect. I want the light to pass through my sample. So it's on glass. And here's my cartoon of different resist thicknesses. When I shine a green light at this, the wavelength of the light will be one particular wavelength in air. When it goes in the resist, due to the different index of refraction of the resist, the wave is going to slow down a little bit, compress, the wavelength gets a little shorter, and then when it exits again, it returns back to the normal speed. Uh, when we have multiple resist thicknesses, the amount of time the light spends in the resist is different, so the amount of time it's compressed is different, and that changes the phase. You can see initially all three of these are starting at the same phase, these different sine curves, but at the end, after they've passed through the resist, they all have a different phase. They've acquired that phase from the different resist thickness, and the different index of refraction of the resist. So uh, what does that look like? So I've got a demonstration here, because everybody likes a demonstration. 
Okay, so let's hope this works. So, shine this up there. You can see the oh. QNFC <laughs> logo, right? So the light is interacting. What if I do it over here? Interacting with the. <laughs> it's interacting with those different resist heights, and it makes that image. That's a computer generated hologram. Um, in reality, that square that I showed you is only the top right corner of that pattern. Uh, this would be a one millimeter by one millimeter SEM image. And even this, the full pattern is four by four millimeters, so it's another 16 times bigger than this. There's a lot of squares that are going into this, um, making this effect. But still, it's only four by four millimeters, which is not that big. So I want to make something even bigger. So this is what I'm holding in my hand. It's this microscope slide. And if you look carefully, you can see I've patterned a ring on the sample here, right? So if I take this back again, I go in the top of the ring, we get the Q and FCF. But if I go down, I've encoded a number of patterns. And so it actually rotates the image around. <laughs> so yeah, the, just to make it more complicated, right? And so then in the end, that area is 16 by 64 millimeters, so a lot bigger than the 10 by 10 uh, that we had problems with earlier. With 10 grayscale levels, it was only exposed in a single exposure, not a multi-pass exposure. And that's about 105 trillion of these 100 by 100 nanometer pixels, and it exposed in under two minutes. So that's what I think is pretty fast. Uh, so it's just a normal exposure on the MLA in terms of the time. There's no overhead for this grayscale process, and yet we get 10 grayscale levels in this case. Okay, so that's my kind of main result with the uh, grayscale stuff. There's one other small point that I want to address at the end of this talk, um, very related. And this is a, a common effect that people see when they're exposing on the MLA. Uh, it's this striping error. So uh, probably most anyone that's underexposed to pattern has seen this kind of striping error. So all I've done here is done a normal, normal, normal binary exposure, no grayscale or anything like that. And I've just exposed this large square you can see in the bottom here. So everything on the outside is unexposed resist. Everything in the middle is exposed. And rather than it being fully exposed and uniform, you can see these vertical stripes. And this is a very common thing. They have a fixed period of 100 microns. And if I take a profilometer and run it across the sample, there's a height variation associated with these stripes. In this particular case, it was 100 nanometers of height variation, uh, which is not good. Although normally, if you were just doing a binary exposure, you would dose this enough that it would fully clear. You wouldn't see these stripes in the middle. But what you might see if you're getting into very small resolution is the edges are not straight. They get a little bit of the same kind of structure, a little bit of a, a wiggle on the edges due to the striping error. I mean, the better you tune your process, the less you see this, but it's still can potentially be uh, something you observe. And the reason for it is due to a non-uniform illumination of the DMD. So here I've got this kind of uniform light blue light hitting our laser, or sorry, hitting our DMD. But in reality, it's probably something more like this, where I hope you can see that it's a little darker in the middle and a little lighter near the edges. It's just because of the way the optics are set up. It's hard to get that power completely uniform across the full DMD. So what can we do about this? Well, since we have this grayscale process, what if we took the ability to change the dose that we have from grayscale, we measured the dose variation that we have from the uh, non-uniformity on the DMD, and we uh, incorporated that into the pattern. We corrected for that in the pattern. So if the dose is slightly lower at the edges, what if we lower the dose in the middle of these stripes as well? It should be a more uniform exposure. And so I've only just started working on this, but Here's that same image of the normal exposure. And here's that uh, square that I've uh, exposed with this compensated exposure where I'm changing the dose across these stripes. And it looks flatter to me by eye. And if I run a profilometer over it, uh, I can see that I don't have this 100 nanometer variation anymore. I've got this much smaller, maybe 10 or 20 nanometer variation. Uh, this one peak is just some crud on the sample. But overall, it seems to be decreasing the the magnitude of these stripes. And so I think it's a very promising thing to look into to further like try and measure and correct for this effect to get flatter, more uniform exposures, not just for grayscale, but for anybody using the tool that kind of wants to address this striping issue. So yes, to conclude, uh, I've kind of demonstrated this pixel density modulation and how it can quickly 
uh, be used for exposure of these grayscale lithography patterns, um, specifically with MLA-150, the tool that we have available. And uh, I want to stress that this conversion uh, uses the standard MLA software once the patterns are converted, so it's very safe. There's no like hacking into the tool to try and make it do something special. It's kind of working within its normal parameters. It's just exposing these grayscale levels on top of a normal exposure. Uh, I think that striping compensation could be very promising, and so that's something I'm going to continue to look into. And overall, I want to continue improving and streamlining the conversion software to make it available to everybody so that anybody can run this grayscale uh, correction on their patterns. So thank you very much. Yes. Um, to correct that uh, striping, uh, can you go one more back? Why, why can't you make the laser beam wider than the BMD and then cut off the edges? I would love to, but I don't. I mean, I, that's for the tool manufacturer to make that decision. So, they, the, 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 the one implementation correction that that they uh, suggest is to reduce the amount of the DMD you use. So rather than using the full width, you use only the middle part, and that does help. But it makes your exposure take longer because you don't have as many pixels to expose, so it increases the exposure time. Yes. If you have the ability to expose 100 by 100 nanometers, uh, why can't that be the resolution? Like, why, why is our resolution not different? So, so, I mean, it is partially limited by the resist itself. With just this type of resist we're using, it's hard to get below that kind of uh, resolution. It's also limited by the wavelength of the light. With at 405, we can't really push down to 100 nanometers of resolution. So the one micron is kind of where we're stuck with this tool. So as far as the grayscale? Yeah, uh, I mean, it should, in theory, work very similar. I have not tested it, but it should be kind of the same idea. If you're changing the development rate, it should still develop at a different rate, and you should be able to get in these kind of height variations. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't looked into it yet, but that is definitely something to, to look at, yeah. Uh, it took it took a while, but now that it's pretty much ready to go, it should just be plug and play. Like you just feed your pattern in, and it'll feed out the result that you want. Uh, what kind of pattern? Like, uh, any GDS file. So, so a GDS file, I would say that it should be converted into the this kind of structure with the individual pixels that you want to expose, not the dose layers. Although I guess that could be included as well. So any any GDS file, which is the standard exposure file for the tool, uh, anyways. Anything else? Yes? Yeah, so um, another question is do you, you give us a, a step, a curve step that shows uh, the time and the, the thickness? Yep. Um, I look at the picture and I see like there are some steps. Like you just look at the middle, there are several you know, yeah, uh, so steps. So uh, I'm wondering is that because you use different time? Like your time is integral? So, so part of it is is probably noise because I just measured this on the profilometer and just kind of quickly extracted the results here. If if you do this with a little more resolution, you do actually get little steps. So at the bottom here, you can kind of see this first step. There's actual like you do start to see steps, and that's actually due to um, standing waves forming in the resist. You get areas where the resist gets essentially slightly over. Uh, it gets a dose variation in the vertical direction, and it leads to these little steps. So if I did this with a little more resolution, you could probably see those steps clearly. Um, and that is something you'd probably want to take into account, to give it, depending on how precise you want your overall pattern to be. 
But for these tests here, all the grayscale work I did, I just assumed this was linear and just said, I want, uh, I mean, I just fit a line to that and, and extracted my doses that way. So I didn't worry too much about that and it still gave pretty reasonable results. So the PMDs are no, so, so the DMD actual size is larger, but it passes through that lens afterwards, and that's what gives you the 100. Uh, I don't have it. Yeah, I didn't include it here, but yes, there's a lens afterward to reduce the overall size. They're probably like 10 to 15 microns, the actual mirror size. So, Yes, yeah, so, so, so you, you can't, I mean, if your pattern is small enough, like uh, the first pattern that I showed you, that one will expose just as it is on the MLA. But if it gets too big, it just can't handle the all those pixels. And so I take my GDS file, I convert it, and it outputs the exposure files for the MLA, and then they just get exposed directly in the software. So you kind of skip that conversion step that you would normally do at the MLA in that way. Thanks very much, Greg. So if anybody has any specific questions about the MLA 150, I mean, Greg is your resident expert in about the stuff. But if you do have any specific questions about the design or anything like that, um, you, know, you can always contact me and I can get you in touch with um, Heidelberg Instruments in regards to the, the technical people down there, if you guys are using any of that. Um, and then now we'll transfer over to Niels, who will be presenting the Nano Fraser. Um, this is another exciting technology that uh, Heidelberg um, acquired, I think, acquired. acquired. Yeah. Um, it was formerly Swiss Litho, um, and the technique that was developed out of IBM. But we will go through it, but uh, I'll All right, thank you. <laughs> OK, so I've prepared another 150 slides for the next two hours, so get comfy. Uh, no, I'll try to be reasonable. Thank you for participating. Thanks for your interest already. So it's a good size of crowds. And uh, I hope you all are doing nanofabrication in one sort or another, or at least are interested in nanofabrication. And I basically will continue resolution-wise where I uh, stop because uh, we are using in the uh, Swiss LISO or now Heidelberg Instruments Nano uh, in instruments. Just a different technique, but a lot of the similarities you will you will come across. So, so they are. This is not. Didn't you didn't put? Did oh, you plug it in? It's probably off. Ah, all right. Okay. Well then. Yeah. Well then, that helps. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I'm basically three parts of it. I will do some introductory of where we are and where we come from, as it has been already mentioned briefly. It's not too important, but it just gives you an idea of where we are coming from and what, why we are talking about what we are talking. And then I will also go with you through the technology a bit more deeply because I find that important and then finish off with, with applications. I will just put like a whole bunch out. Okay? All right, so you heard already IBM. In the 90s, uh, the Millipede project was a big thing because the AFMs were on the rise and one, the idea was let's build a high density memory using AFM technology. Now basically poking in a groove into a surface that you can then erase by using a hot AFM chip. Now you all use flash drives for particular reasons and flash drives are quick on the market. And uh, so we don't use millipede uh, drives. However, it has been developed over well over a decade with a lot of manpower and a lot of technology around it, not just the AFM, but what is it? Chemistry, the, the controlling of the tip, the tip size itself, the tip design. So IBM sort of like 2008, 2010, sort of repackaged the whole thing. And my boss at that time was PhD student there, so he was in the lucky place and then got asked whether we want to commercialize it under the new name called Nano Fraser. So that's the whole story. So even so, we are technically a startup. We are technology-wise not really a startup. I mean, the technology is way older. And so we are still in the beautiful area of Zurich, but we have now our colleagues in Heidelberg. Heidelberg bought uh, Swiss Lizzo two years ago, 
And uh, so we now also have access to the laser technology, but we'll get to that in a second. But it's also good to have a big uh, family that helps. Uh, because we are 20 in Zurich and we have 200 in Germany, and so that we boost our, our, ourselves as well. Okay, so here, so that's the millipede they had in mind. So that was the idea of having Paul Aries. Right now we are working with a single tip. And this summer we are coming up with 10 tips, so we are slowly getting back to it, but we had to debug a bit faster than the technical problems uh, before. And which sort of machine, uh, I will have the slides for this extra, so I can show you what machines look like. Our customers obviously are people like you, it's scientists. We are also, uh, most of our team are scientists, so I'm a fresh or like me, I stayed a few more years uh, being a lab rat, so on, and I enjoyed that a lot. And now I have the pleasure of talking about it, the technology. Uh, I myself also used the DWL66 uh, when I was a PhD student, so I spent a fair share in, in the clean room. This is what we are working with. And now I was ho I'm hoping that you find at least one or two of the <laughs> keywords here uh, where your project is related. Uh, one hopes. Um, also, some, some one of the reasons people uh, or the team was deciding to put me into this position is because my background is biophysics. Uh, I've done a lot of cell culture, uh, cell surface, cell interaction, and cell uh, uh, different roughnesses for cells and cell mechanics. So um, what we want to do is, besides of exciting people like you here in the quantum realm and working, perhaps you have colleagues who are working with biology and life science, and because I think what I'm showing here can be used not just in the physics or engineering department, but also in the life science department as well, as in biology. Okay, so what do we do? I said already AFM, so we come with a hot AFM tip, and I'll get into the details of that, and structure the surface. So high resolution for us means oh, sub-20 nanometer, I would say. So um, on a, when we do site acceptance test, this is 25 nanometers. Everybody who played a little bit more longer is easily in the range of 15 nanometers. It has been demonstrated, but that was extremely optimized case. So I would say, like, yes, we can make eight nanometer structures, but not daily. Okay? But 15, yeah. Because when I, coming from microfluidics, doing 17 nanometers the first uh, afternoon, I sort of proudly it's like, here, what the hell is going on? And it was a little bit more put on this. Are you doing? Come back when you've done 20, sub 20. Yeah. So I played another hour and had, to, had exchanged the tip. So as you can see, so if you. I keep on saying that when I promote this technology, you can hold a pair of tweezers and run a computer. You get to go. That's all you need. Right. All right. So high speed, speed throughput is already a uh, topic that has been mentioned here. It's an AFM technique, so we are high speed in that context. Okay. So we are. If you want to expose an eight-inch radio with 100, 100 nanometer structure, please do stick to the EV. Okay. Um, we, I had one discussion with a guy who said, like, yeah, but we have to do everything 8 inch and with 15 nanometer resolution. So I like, okay, let's start today and I'll come back when I retire. Uh, that's pointless. <laughs> courses for courses, as the English saying is, and then here we do small prototypes. And if you need a lot of nano structures, then let's consider nano imprint lithography, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And almost any material that also often raises questions. So what do you mean by that? Anything that's flat. Okay. So as long as it's flat and you can put it on the stage and there's no vacuum involved that I I mean flat as in we can get there as needed. As long as that is possible, we are all good to go. The beauty of having an inbuilt AFM machine is you can structure an image as well. And we use that a lot and it will get clearer as soon as I show the cartoon how the excuse me, uh, technology is running. And uh, the 3D pattern it has already been shown. It's slightly differently done in, in our case because we pull down the tip and can structure pretty much to any degree uh, as you are how content. Um, there is a software limitation of 256 levels, but if you, let's say you have a 50 or 60 nanometer layer of resistance and divide that by 256, you get pretty decent steps. So, uh, we have uh, also a Canadian fellow who at the ETH, uh, Nolan. He makes a sinusoidal uh, structures and he pretty much doesn't see any steps. And another beauty thing, and this is probably very relevant to what you guys are doing, 
if you are out, for example, working in the 2D world, or you, if you're, you want to contact an buyer, you want to contact a 2D flake, you have your samples on the substrate, you pull down the USS, and then you want to know where it is. So you go with the AFM, again, this is very, in situ imaging is, is very helpful. Find just a triangle, go also to K layout, use as, as a draw fresh, or have something pre-drawn, adjust it to where you want it, and then go and expose. So, and another beauty is, and that is in contrast to E-beam technology, is since we are not blasting in a high energy beam, we are not implanting any charges, and we are not damaging crystal structures. That's the, the most important message on, in, in this regard. Even though we are coming down with heat, keep in mind the heat we are applying is, say, 200 Celsius for a small range and so it doesn't penetrate deep into your material. So if you have something that would be truly difficult to handle heat-wise, you would put like a 10 or 15 nanometer resistance between and you know, there's no heat that, that would reach your sample. So that's the beauty. So it's very elegant and, and, and not brute force. Um, you can do a lot of things with, with a hot tip. Um, probably all of us have done it at some point as a kid, taking a welder iron and sort of carve something out of wood. That is, in a very simple way, speaking what we also do. Um, but we don't burn things, so what you can do is, if, you, if it is plastic, you, could, you, you know, can indentate something, getting over the glass temperature. What we mostly do for our lithography process is we degrade and resist. I'll get to that in a second. But you can also use it for triggering a physical phenomenon, like a phase change, which is pretty decent to do, or want to do a chemical reaction trigger. Let's say you have a chemistry, I have one example at the end, where you get rid of a um, capping group, open up a, an amine, and then you can start having a very narrowly structured surface where you do, for example, in this case, I, I always see that good for nano areas for biomarkers. Okay, you can do a lot of as well. Uh, Samuel is a student at ETH. He has summarized it, it just comes out these days. If you have interest, uh, please let me know. And um, he has summarized hundreds of papers about salmon scanning for the software field. It's a really good review. But it's, I keep on saying it's coming out next week, but uh, I've, I've seen the preprint, so it's, but I wasn't supposed to show it yet. So, uh, okay, so we are focusing for the next slides on the degradation and desorption of our resist. So that's the slide with all the details about the AFM tip. Well, for 30 years of uh, development has gone into this. What you can't see here is so the tip is basically where I'm shining the laser light on. If it is, this was a special array, uh, a special um, arrangement here that it actually glows. It normally doesn't glow, uh, but here they, they wanted to show that off. And uh, ah, I see it is all changed a bit while putting it on your computer. Anyways, uh, uh, so so you can you have this little resist. Resistive heater here in the middle finger. That is basically where you just by omic heating uh, uh, run the current through and it gets up to 1100, 1200 Celsius. But you don't get all of that heat at the very tip. So you lose most of it basically. Uh, I would say well, quarter, so that's pretty much what you get at the very tip. Um, we have since we're using 200, 250 Celsius for most of the uh, applications, if people want to do it, yeah, but I want 500 Celsius. Okay, fine, then let's blunt the tip. Uh, <laughs> so, so like, so go backwards, uh, run the heater massively. Uh, instead of standing, we are normally eight microseconds per pixel. Let's say 50 microseconds per, seconds per pixel. And, and, and so, so really basically press and, and, and go up beyond what we normally apply. Um, we also have, in, in contrast to normal AFM, where you have a laser light shining at the bank, back of your cantilever, and then it, it sort of vibrates and, and you read out the reflection. Here we have a topography sensor, it's also differently doped. And upon your first in, um, uh, getting closer to your surface, the last few hundred nanometers are used by the uh, sensor, reading out the temperature that is basically you put your pulse here, you pulse the temperature. If you are in, in air, it has a certain characteristic. The closer you go to your substrate, the air is basically pulled into the substrate, and that changes the uh, the whole curvature for that sensor. And the sensor knows automatically how high above the surface you are. 
feeds it back into the control of your cantilever and that makes it substantially faster than uh, what normally AFMs do. All right, tip size, uh, five nanometers is pretty much what we normally have. And uh, all right, so now you know all about the tips. The other thing is what you do with that tip is triggering a degradation of a polymer, polyphthalaldehyde. Polyphthalaldehyde has been around since the 60s and then got entirely forgotten. It was reinvented in the 80s. So I guess this is probably why our uh, collaborator in Berlin all resists is calling it Phoenix 81. It comes back up. <laughs> and so here you can see we basically dive that hot tip into the surface and then read what we have done like so. So let's say you load a, a grayscale image and you tell the software, well, this gray value means 5 nanometers and this gray value means 15 or whatever it is, what your, your fancy is, and then it goes line by line, heating up, getting rid of the resist, then it sort of swings out, autumn comes back and it's already at room temperature and then it goes in contact mode, reading back what you have. The beauty here is, so in, if you're on your first approach, it looks already if your sample is tilted or well, it is a little tilted, which way it is tilted, but there could be something wrong. There's something underneath or there is there's a particle, whether you like it or not. So it can, within limits, sort of correct. Uh, and if it is too much, then it's that flat and said, okay, hang on, stop, stop, go 10 microns up north and, and try the same thing again. So that's the beauty because. In, in contrast to, to let's say, the tip to being you expose, you develop, you put the SEM. If you're lucky, you know, and you have this here, and, and you don't have to wait for days, and other universities aren't that lucky, then you look and say, oh, okay, let's put the uh, system again. Uh, so um, here you make immediately, you, you basically walk away from the system and you have something that you can work with. So that's, that's a really beauty. And once you're done patterning, then it is all up to you. And I find this out, I also said that earlier, to, um, basically it's, it's a tripod. You have the machine that, that needs to apply, it is the software that runs the machine, but the other, just as important, is, is your processing. It's not, or thinking outside the box, too, you know, if you want to do this differently. Because here I'm oversimplifying with a single layer that is structured. We do this sometimes just for our. Uh, uh, we do at conventions, uh, like take a picture of the crowd and, and then sort of chisel it out, so to speak, out of the uh, resist. But in most cases, you have multi-layer, like two-layer or three-layer. It all depends on the application. You can't just say you have to do this. You have to do this. So once it is patterned, then you transfer it into uh, your substrate or on top of your substrate. It could be either by etching, taking stuff away, or by adding material. So all the clean room techniques apply. Okay, so that's the same thing. And some even use it, uh, uh, this is a free structure like Nolan that I just mentioned. He uses basically his, uh, he makes negative uh, structure out of the uh, PPA, the polyphthalaldehyde, fills it up with silver and has his uh, nanophotonic structure, so for example. Okay, so our bread and butter is connecting structures. So this is I mean, where most of my colleagues come from. Uh, and so, so what you see here also that will remind you of K layout. So you let's say you have a nanowire and you want to compact that. Don't ask me why that is asymmetrically. Uh, I'm sure the customer had a reason, but, but this is uh, uh, what they had. So that you have this nanowire, you scan over it, you find, oh, uh, that, that's the one I want, okay. Then you go to K layout, you basically define where your nanowire is. Then you have your electrodes, keep exposing the PPA, and then keep on uh, develop it, uh, develop, and then do, uh, in this case, a 30 nanometers resolution. You probably are good with a two layer, you don't need a high resolution stack, and then just metallize the surface, do your lift off. There you go, you get exactly what you want. Um, obviously also works with other 2D materials. Um, has been done really well work by uh, Elisa Vieiros group in, in New York, who then showed that, because we always, always ah, we compare what you normally do with an e beam and, and, and we coming so delicately from the surface, we were always, I think our contacts are better. 
and we couldn't prove that because of um, resources and, and luckily um, Elisa's group did that and so they could actually show that indeed you get since you are not even so if you discount this with it, uh, in, in normal e beam process there is still something left on the surface whether you like it or not in some areas and so your metallization is not as good as supposed to be and since we really get rid of all of it uh, we normally have either a, a final resist layer or it, again it all depends on what sort of 2d material you want to contact we discount with the last flash uh, at least uh, if i'm correct just a flash of oxygen plasma to get really the last bit uh, and if you have graphene underneath you have a, 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 a protective coating underneath and there is nothing left of the system so this is why the metallization is better so it's it, the whole work boils down to it's, clean, it's cleaner. Uh, it's just a coincidence that we are a Swiss company, so it's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay, so um, also here, this is a, an IBM uh, example that, that has been worked on for quite a while. And they tried to contact these indium arsen, uh, arsenide uh, nanowires, and each time they made the de device with the knee beam, they got so many charges implanted. <laughs> No, they did one <laughs> with the nano Raven work right away. So uh, yay for us. Um, but yeah, it was quite a bit of a debugging for, for the IBM. So we are still in close contact. We work together with them. We have projects uh, together with the IBM uh, crew. And here again, I'm showing Elisa's work, but not for a completely different uh, reason. Because what I want to show you here is that we have uh, our nano electrodes. And then you have large areas. And now. The question is, why on earth would I do my 100 microns hat with an AFM? That's going to take forever. And now being part of Heidelberg, we said, yeah, that's a, that's a valid point. Uh, let's make a machine that has both. It has a laser and an AFM. Tip. And we are not using the laser to trigger any photochemistry. We use the laser as a heat gun. Okay, So we do the same thing. And so, so that was quite a development, but last year was the year where we basically released it into the wild. Had three beta sites at Harvard, at EPFL, and Jülich, Germany, and so collected all the data, upgraded the system, and since I would say October, so since the last, end of last year, it basically is a commercial available uh, add-on to the, to the systems. Once again, uh, for, for those of you who are interested in the whole process, so you come with the tip, you open it up, the PPA, then you develop it, and then metallize, and you get your need. And so here, this is actually quite impressive. If you think of it, I mean, your 2D material isn't that really thick. It's like, like a nanometer or so, max. And you still can see it buried if it is under, say, 20, 30 nanometers of, of resist. So that's, uh, that's pretty decent uh, resolution wise. <laughs> okay, so what else can you do with it? Um, you can contact and you can structure by metallization, as I've already said. So, so obviously, that's interesting for people who are doing nanophotonics, making all sorts of Arrays, for example, uh, um, out of gold. Uh, in this case, these are the petals. <coughs> and what I failed again, my background isn't EV. My background is nano uh, microfluidics. And I saw this picture. I was like, yeah, so what? It's just three dots. Yeah, you can make three dots. And then they said, like, yeah, look at the scales. Like, yeah, you can make three small dots. What I failed to notice is you don't have any uh, proximity effect around this. So no halo whatsoever. That's a beauty. And the second thing is, while going over it and doing your structures, they don't get influenced by each other. So whatever shape you can imagine, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the take-home message here. It's, it is one design doesn't do it, uh, work against the other. Plus, you don't get, have any any halo around the structure, so which is pretty neat. And that's the that's the important part here. What I also see again coming from from the life science uh, department. Yes, you can shine light on it, that is important, but you could also use any of these gold areas as anchors. You, you throw in a silent group and then go a sugar reaction and have a biomolecule to the mini structures. If you have, we, we just had, instead of having dots, you can have larger arrays, and we already had the example here with the hologram. 
so we had uh, so how do you do large areas that's the large area in our terminology half millimeter by half millimeter and that gives you an idea it took about 10 hours to do you don't have to sit in front of it right so you just switch on the machine go and come in the next morning for example and what it does is it starts top left say you do your 50 by 50 microns you're done the machine steps to the next 50 by 50 and before it continues it reaches out reads back what it has to structure corrects because there's always some sound of drift and so on so it corrects for all sort of drift that it's supposed to be and then the software starts continuing so it does this automatically and we have basically a stitching error through this sub 10 nanometers so uh, if I've been told correctly, so, so one poor student had to go through with the SEM and look for stitching errors. So. <laughs> uh, luckily for us, uh, he couldn't find any. So um, yeah, so this is extremely well. This is also a benefit of having the AFM here because you just go and, and, and correct if need be. Um, so far, everything was binary, right? Metal or no metal? I see. Um, so. Let's see how it develops with, with two and a half to 3D structures. So the same Professor Dong in Korea, has one of our machines, designed a, a hologram, in this case with eight steps, and used a 64 nanometer layer of resist. And then basically, like the Grand Canyon, he sort of etched into that uh, substrate. And you find that design, obviously, and AFM tip, that's not much of a difference, as you would expect. But then he etched it in and again got exactly what he wanted. Um, I have to say that a tenfold amplification of the depths is not regular. I don't know what they have done there. It must have been extremely gentle with the edge gases. Four and a half to five X is typical. However, we worked with uh, IMAC in, in, in Belgium to do some, some ALD and, and, and have some aluminum oxide sort of synthesized into the PPA just a little bit and then that also boosts the selectivity but if you don't do anything uh, four and a half to five fold is what you get uh, towards uh, silicon so and you can spin this basically deeper and deeper going from eight levels to almost um, know, infinite but, but uh, as many layers as possible so we did here um, an engineering test basically not structured one and a half three four and a half and so on in one and a half nanometer discrete steps and then check how reliable is each of these uh, squares. Turns out, well, you are in 0.7 nanometer, so it's fairly reliable, I would say. And then you can also do these kind of sinoidal uh, surfaces, which is what, uh, uh, what I took from, from Nolan's work uh, about the, uh, having sinoidals and he then basically calculated, and that was something I found really important so he, he simulated, and simulation in this case also, he has simulated data and his, the experimental data, I wouldn't say 100% overlap, I would, but I would give them at least 90%. Right? So that was quite impressive. So you get what you want, and this is, uh, is really helpful. Has been also used, also that's an IBM research uh, an experiment where they did exactly uh, microcavities for, for trapping photons. And here again, it also depends on how, how wide is your, is your Gaussian microcavity, how deep it is. So the, the curvature is important. The rest, uh, a multi-layer um, uh, structure is, is the standard. And you, you have to rely on, is my cavity exactly what I want? And with the same, with the same technique, going in and, and, and out, oh, but I, oh, it's run too fast. They got exactly what they wanted. The certain geometries correspond to certain wavelength of trapping the photons. And the interesting uh, physics start when you do pairs, and then you do pairs of equal uh, geometry, and then have electrons tunneling from one uh, no, from one trap to another, which uh, has been also published recently. So this sort of 3D possibility is also what you have. And then if you don't want to edge, if you don't want to do anything, you just produce the PPA as a structure itself once you're done with, uh, with, with the uh, AFM work. Here again, our colleagues from IBM, for example, made the racetrack for, for little particles, so a nanoparticle uh, uh, movement in only one direction. 
And that happens here as a marketing gimmick, but also if you want to use it in order to separate before the, uh, in this case it's 60 and 100 nanometer particles, excuse me. But the claim that in, in theory, depending on how well you do your, uh, your, your steps, your ratchets, you can separate them down to one nanometer. I haven't seen that yet, but uh, this was the initial work with 60 and 100, and that worked already pretty fine, apart from this guy sort of sticking to the wall until the end of the video. But then it sort of <laughs> gets the hint and <laughs> moves down the, down the lane. Um, so this is interesting for, for, for any kind of particle uh, sorting without any further uh, structuring. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a good start. You could also use the coffee stain effect while just use your PPA and for making the grooves and, and, and then have a the liquid retracting and depositing basically always at the, its very rim each of the uh, uh, rod. This is actually what was my boss did during his PhD. And you deposit small nanoparticles in very particular uh, locations with very little error uh, in, towards the axis, obviously. Um, so this is something also to take home and be used for. Perhaps for antennas, I would use still uh, the, uh, the, the standard lithography, but if you, if you just use the whole nano array, I can see that uh, working very well. What I have been, uh, what I just came across last summer was uh, by a student, master student at Singapore University. She was on an exchange mission in, in Australia, where we also have a machine, and scanned over collagen fibers and found that they are regularly, no big surprise here. But what is interesting is that if you have such a regular structure and you want to investigate that, um, then you can basically turn it into a grayscale image, or in this case a binary, and then she made these binary structures and wanted to see, and that's always the first thought, is that cytotoxic, would my cells sit on this like they would sit on the collagen? This is a very preliminary work. She only showed, well, only she showed that uh, the material once exposed to the heat is not cytotoxic because cells behave on the structure like they would behave in your petri dish. In this case, the next step would be then to use tendon cells and then use a proper biological question, but it's, a, it's an important first step to show you can use the PPA for whatever kind of uh, also biological application, which again, obviously, I find very appealing. Okay, so much for structuring or structuring your uh, surface by just using the uh, resist we are promoting. There are other materials. We are promoting the, the spinolphthalaldehyde uh, uh, because it has the least contamination on the tip. So in theory, the tip is never get contaminated. In practice, it does at some point, depending on how deep and how much you feel right. And uh, PPA leaves the least residue. Uh, people working on silk, people working on other polymers, I've, I've seen all of that, but if you want something solid and if you want something that's working on a daily basis, um, PPA is the material you want to stick to, literally. So, but you can also use it as a heat gun. I, I said this in the beginning of the talk, and I will show you a few examples that might uh, trigger your um, interest. So Eduardo Albizetti used to be a postdoc in Elisa Riedo's group, and he's now in Italy. He was interested in making spintronic devices, had um, a layer, a multi-layer of uh, rare earth uh, materials uh, coated to his uh, spin, um, epitaxially grown on his, on his uh, surface, heated it all up with a permanent magnet underneath and orientated all of it in one direction. Okay, so far so simple. Now comes the important bit. He then came down with the, with the hot AFM tip, heated a small area. So you have your tip and the area around, I would say, gives that a 20 nanometer diameter in, in total. Reorientated his permanent magnet, and then you take the tip away. And this warming and cooling is in the range of 100,000 Kelvin per second. So it has no chance to reapply. So, so it just, you go in, heat up, turn the back magnet, you go away and it is instantly cold. And this way you can reorder and rearrange your surface mag uh, magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic properties in, in, in particular ways. Same works for a big polymer. 
uh, EPFL again, they use this, normally this uh, supramolecule polymer is uh, in, by nature green, but as soon as you mix it up and then cool down, it forms aggregates and then it progresses reddish. And you can use this, like if you do doblate it to a surface, for example, and let it cool down your cooling rates in the Kelvin per second range. Again, this is the hot tip. We are more in the 100,000 Kelvin range. And this allows you to basically A, indent it, and B, cool it down fast enough so you do have basically two fluorescent channels uh, addressable, as well as the roughness. So uh, Samuel then did this for us, our co uh, company logo. Uh, as a QR code, basically, uh, this was in connection with nano features, for example, nano safety features for products. I think it's one of the last uh, applications I have again heat used here for triggering a chemical reaction by getting rid of a carbamate group that is capping a primary amine. And Eduardo also worked on this, and he showed that it depends on how much energy, or how deep, and how long you stay on the surface. Nothing happens or very little happens, uh, and then at some point you come over a trigger point. You trigger most in a certain dynamic range where you trigger partially or all of the uh, amine exposures, and then you can sort of do whatever structure you want. Showed this again. So the more energy you put in, the more amines are open. The amines are then reacting with the biotin, the biotin is the streptavitin, and then you make your biotin sandwich. In this case, it's fluorescently labeled. So this is for a typical way of just showing uh, how you do surface uh, yeah, arrays. And this brings me uh, to the laser again. So what you do is, for example, with the MLA-150, um, it's also an example we've done together with the colleagues from, Heidel, uh, from, from, from IBM, using a Heidelberg-like machine. Expose all the lithography that you want. Then you go, scan where you are. This is why it is not straight. Uh, it, was, it was tilted to, to demonstrate that. So everything in orange-brown has been then exposed with the laser. And the thing you can't see in the middle has been exposed with the AM tip. And the device then looks like this. You Here, Colin got a re resolution in the range of 10, 12 nanometers, making the single electron transistors. Finally, so what do these machines look like? They come in two flavors. One is the benchtop machine. Um, they, both machines have almost identical features, apart from the sums that I point out. Uh, the benchtop one is in the range of two inch substrates. If you have to have four inch, it doesn't work there, obviously. And um, another beauty is it's rather compact. So if you don't have a lot of space uh, in, in the clean room, for example, or wherever, it will fit very well in a corner. And it also fits in an M brown glove box, which is neat because uh, we just had this, uh, the first unit's gonna be shipped this spring uh, to China, where we uh, basically decoupled then all the noise and then got rid of all the uh, issues we had with uh, vibration. And the big question was if you have this, is the lack of noise, because we normally do all of that in an environmental thing. But no, luckily, so <laughs> noise was not the problem. And uh, the engineers was, were capable now to insulate it all well enough so mm -hmm. vibration is not a problem. Uh, I think if I'm correctly informed, what you do right now is you write, switch off the environment, and then after, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, stop writing, give it a bit of a wash, and then continue uh, writing. So this is the, the scholar, the smaller machine. And the bigger one has been also on the flyer. It's about a yay tall. Is big, a meter deep. It's bigger, bigger is better, not always, but in this case, bigger allows us to throw in a laser. And uh, that laser is, is, is together with Heidelberg for doing exactly what I showed before. You have something nano, you want to fan out, and you want to do a, also 100 nano, uh, micron structures. Uh, so you do this all in one go with that machine. And it also has a slightly faster stage. And, and this one takes four inch, and even depending on the new stage we build, and even six or uh, six inch. All right, I think, yeah, this one has the laser. Said that. So we, to 
summarize the whole thing. So it's a new technology. It's, uh, it sometimes requires perhaps thinking outside the box, but it allows you to structure surfaces down to sub-20 nanometers. It's an alternative tool for e -beam. It doesn't mean an e -beam completely uh, obsolete, but it may for some projects, and therefore freeing up some time. For the e are normally quite good. Um, it's super easy, as I said earlier, and everybody can use that. But it is, uh, even I can, so I that say something. Um, and it is yeah, super simple and robust to use. So this is, and with the no damage, I think this is ex especially for the 2D community an important bit because yeah, the uh, implantation of, of charges is, is, is an issue. Um, we also meet, uh, we have a meeting of, uh, well, before we, before I meet, uh, so we have 25 systems out. Some, uh, the next one for you guys is uh, at McGill. Uh, we have one in Harvard, one in New York, South, South Carolina, Salt Lake City, and Dayton, Ohio. These are the ones in North America. The others are spread in Europe and in, in, in Asia. And I said, uh, thank you for your attention. We do have a workshop in three weeks time, four weeks time. So if you want to do a last minute call to Switzerland, uh, don't forget the skis. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, thank you for your attention. Just, uh, I don't know if it's a good answer, just, but what's the price range for these machines? The small one is in the range of a quarter million US dollars, and the big one is uh, in the range of about half a million. It all depends on what sort of contract, what sort of, do you want the laser, yes or no, can you not afford the laser, then the first try to throw it in later. You always try to get the laser in, not to make more uh, revenue, that's not the point, because it makes more a complete system. Um, so, I had one customer the other as well. But that's the limit we can't do them somehow when we do them in years time with a little bit long. But, but uh, this is very often very flexible uh, with, with quotation data. Uh, when people say, like, oh, can you sort of send us a price list? And it's kind of really pointless. And apart from these two ballpark figures, because it really depends what is your need. Um, for example, I have, I'm also responsible for the UK. And there is often a UK requirement as a three years service contract. Oh, it's 50,000. Right there. Yes, no. Um, and so, and then also depending on what sort of service. And so, so then people ask us, you know, give us, send us a quotation, please. And really, uh, yeah, how much is a car? It's just, you know, you get a car for 500,000, you get a car for 500,000 dollars. It really depends on, on, on what you're asking for. So this is why if, if, if every, any time if, uh, for it's Lisa, I approach us, we, what we normally do is um, ring or ideally uh, do an online meeting where we discuss what is your need, what do you want to do? Uh, that really helps us then, okay, let's narrow it down. Yeah. We don't have as many options as the MLA 150, there are also with different lasers, also with different optics, but even with the um, small amount of uh, technical, Variation, you know, sort of the, you know, financial required, and then it depends on what sort of funding scheme you, you look for. And with the com more complete machine, I find it easier than to find other PIs to select. You know what? That's interesting for me as well. That's interesting for five, six, seven professors. Let's go collectively and ask the department to do this. You know, that's sometimes very really helpful. How often do we have each other? That also depends on what you do. We always say three working, three days running, uh, so 24 hours writing. That's correct and completely wrong at the same time. Uh, we have our service engineer. He tries to do endurance uh, exposures, and he goes and goes and goes. Friday afternoon, he switches on the machine, comes back Monday, takes the tip out and uses it on the next week again. So he does many days, but he only does four nanometer and 14 nanometer wide structures. If you decide, ha, huh, okay, I want to do my 3D structures, which are 70 nanometers deep, the chance of contaminating or picking up something is way higher. So we always say three days, but uh, 
Normally, a multi-user facility uses 150 tips per year ish. And a tip is you know, range depends also on your offer, 60 US dollars a retail price. So, yeah. so we try to keep that low because we want to be the solution. So okay. you, you do the writing uh, at Amiam Air, right? As yes. Opposed to Air. Is there any advantage to, to do it on the vacuum? No? no. The vacuum will not limit the contamination? No, no it doesn't help. We, what we do is sometimes we run a uh, hyper transfer, just because, just to make sure. Okay. And then uh, uh, we can get, get rid of the vacuum pump. Let's keep some. And why is it faster than ever? Why, why is it faster than ever? Well, it's due to the uh, quicker uh, data uh, turnaround, basically. <coughs> if you have to shine a line, throw it back into the photomultiplier to read it out and then feed this back into the pump. Not activation that takes longer than being it knowing it and, and it automatically feeding into the electronic control. That's quicker. Okay. Uh, so you said that the tips can be as wide as two nanometers. Uh, five. Five. Yeah. Yeah, the slide yeah, the very radius is two. Exactly. Yeah, five, two, two something. How, how do you High end etching. Yeah. High, sorry. So we have some really good collaborators with the etching. Yeah, yeah. It's a great city. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's what I'm saying. Like, that the work in the tip design and in the tip manufacturing process. Like that. So we're almost talking thirty years in development. Yeah. How much time does it take to change the tip, and how difficult is it to do so? It takes about three minutes, I would say. Open the door, grab the holder, decide what which tip you want to do, and it's real time. Okay, you open it up, you place the holder down, upside down, you have a thing that it stands on, and you press it down so it releases on the screw springs the tip. You grab your tweezer, pull it out on that hand, take the other one, slide it in. Pretty much that long. And then you have to drive down the two, three millimeters that you moved away from the surface. That takes a little bit of time. But yeah, this is why I always say that like, if you can hold a pair of tweezers, you get to go. No. So because your process is very long, like 10 hours, so if something interrupts the current data, mm -hmm. it is interrupted. So I have to start again? From zero or it I very much to... depends. I mean, with the 10 hours, that was just they wanted to have this whole design done. Often designs aren't that complex, right? You have, or you have dot arrays, for example. And you go dot, 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 dot. And then if something after 10 or so hours happened, you might decide, oh, you know what? I'll take the top 60% of what I've done and I make a second design underneath. That, that really is. It depends on it. most of the designs. Of what I've done is like 50 by 50 or 100 by 100 microns, the device size. Half an hour, it's an hour. All depends on how many features you have. Yeah. 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 So it's not. And you don't lose whole day. This is exactly uh, uh, the moment. Yeah. Just the so the maximum temperature was like 1100? 1100 at the heater. At the heater, right? So that means if you if you, if you want to transmit heat to the surface, 200 Celsius is what we normally do on a day-to-day -day business. Um, I was involved in a phase change experiment where we wanted to have way more, we wanted like 400 Celsius. And I used one of my plant tips uh, um, that, for example, live forever because we can't get it any more <laughs> And so that has about like 70 nanometer phase, so that also helps them, right? And um, he said, I got uh, instead of eight microseconds, I really stayed on that glass uh, plate, it's like 50 microseconds for bits and, and changed the whole thing. Yeah. You talked about writing on like any surface that's flat. Yes. Uh, have you ever done any lithography with this type of technique on like a curved surface, like a are there any limitations? There are limitations. I mean, if it's really roundish, like spherical, that would pose a problem. Uh, slightly round is not a problem because, again, from the initial, um, not 
approach of the, on the surface, you read out your plane on surface. Mm -hmm. Slightly tilted or sort of minimum. If it has a large radius, not a big. If it has strong recesses, you need to get the lens to tip. Yeah. Right. So, like, would it sort of pick up a height at every <coughs> writing field? Yeah, it's not, so since it measures how, how high it is, it, it will follow that track okay. to a certain degree. Right? Yeah, but, but not like within the writing field, it would correct dynamically. Yeah. And uh, again, this, we had some people asking, like, yeah, we have, I have something that's 50 micron wide, 2 micron deep, can I use it? Yes, you can in the middle. You know, right? uh, on the side, your, I mean, your coating is going to look crap to begin with because you will have uh, that. But in the middle, oh, absolutely. Right? As long as we get there, it's the needle. Yeah. 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 So, uh, like, so there is a chance that they can, people are going to contact with them, like, uh, or register or they can. So, how the user will know that they can, where the people are going to contact? The system will tell you. The system will tell you because um, unless you see it already, so everything you do, there's also a, a microscope showing you what you do. If you barely see it, there's sort of like a jitter, right? And then once it has done a certain part of your design, you say, ah, okay, now I'm seeing something. Um, however, for example, this is the beginning. You want to expose, you go down, and it will tell you, hang on, this is an old tip. Not because it knows how old that one is, it has nothing to code it in, but it will notice from the amount, it, um, from the ID curve, it goes, it goes down, measures, and then you go ahead. And from this, how much it stays while moving out, it calculates by how big is your contact area. The contact area, and then it will say, I think you're 50 nanometers, that's not going to work with high resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. One thing, if you have demos, if you want to have demos done, then just contact us. I never got it explained in that detail. <laughs> that was really helpful.